Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for A View from Earth. We wanted to start this episode off by acknowledging the importance of the current social climate with regards to the Black Lives Matter movement. This planetarium stands with all who strive to end injustices, whether they be racial, economic, gender-based, educational, environmental, or anything else. Long dismissed voices deserve to be heard and amplified, both now and into a more equitable future. While we do not want to take away from the crucial communications that are happening right now through online platforms, we do want to provide the opportunity for people to take a few minutes out of their day to learn with us and to share the cosmos with us. We truly believe that there is enough space for everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome to A View from Earth, the official podcast of Fisk Planetarium at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Now, as with the rest of the university and lots of spaces around the world, this theater is closed to the public for the foreseeable future due to the COVID-19 epidemic. However, we are still so committed and excited to bring astronomy and education to you that we've started a whole host of free online offerings so that we can stay connected and keep bringing you the FISC content that you know and love, plus some new stuff like this podcast. So thanks for tuning in and learning with us here today. A little bit about us here. My name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm also the outreach coordinator and a presenter here at FISC. My friend Colin is here too. Colin, let's hear a little bit about you. Hey, I'm Colin. Uh, I am a student here at CU Boulder. I study astronomy and I am also a presenter at FISC. Uh, here on A View from Earth, our goal is to introduce you to scientists and students here in the Colorado area who are working on some really amazing projects. And these are folks from all different areas of astronomy, from black holes to asteroids to astronomy education to terraforming Mars and everything in between. This week, we have an interview with the director of the Fisk Planetarium, Dr. John Keller. Aside from being the planetarium director, he's also a planetary scientist and does research in astronomy education. So today he'll be telling us about some of the interesting projects that he's working on, plus a bit about his experience as the director. These are excerpts from an interview we did back on May 12th. Enjoy. So now we are joined by Dr. John Keller, the director of the Fisk Planetarium. John, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Very excited for this first podcast. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. We're excited uh, too. Really quick, would you briefly explain your backstory and how you ended up doing what you were doing? What brought you to being the director of the Planetarium and other things that you do here at CU Boulder? Oy vey. Um, sure. So I went to my first planetarium show as a second grader at Capitol High School in Boise, Idaho. I distinctly remember that visit with the Clayton family and the Keller family. And that's when I first said, whoa, stars are pretty cool. Um, we'd moved from Los Angeles to Idaho right, right before then. And so I had the benefit of spending the rest of my childhood through high school growing up in Idaho, which has very dark skies. My parents got me a telescope when I was a sixth grader, kind of four years later. And kind of, and I essentially knew from all through my high school years, and sorry, grade school through high school years, that I really liked astronomy. Um, when I went to college, I did not pursue that. I actually studied biology, um, and I didn't really know why I was studying biology, except that I liked science. And biology let me take some physics, and take some chemistry, and take some biology, and take some astronomy, and take some earth science. And so I generally had the opportunity to take lots of science classes, but I wasn't really focused around where I wanted to go with that degree. And so after I finished, after I got to junior year and declared my major as a biologist, I said, well, what am I gonna do? And I was uh, presented with the opportunity to stay at Stanford for one more year and get a teaching credential and become a high school science teacher, which actually was perfect because I realized that I really liked science and getting to explain science, to get, work with science, work with students about science was really, really fulfilling. Um, during that time that I was teaching high school in the Bay Area, uh, after I graduated, um, I actually, I also had the chance to work at NASA for several summers aboard the, working with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which is a space, which is an airplane that flies at about 40,000 feet 
to look at the infrared universe. And so I did summer work in, at NASA Ames Research Center, and I did school year work during the school year teaching high school students. And it was really through those five years of teaching and researching and teaching and researching that I realized that I did want to be an astronomer. I just hadn't realized that till I was 26. And so I um, actually then came to the University of Colorado Boulder uh, to, get a, to get a graduate degree in astronomy. Uh, I didn't have enough physics and math as my classmates. And so I actually took a lot of um, undergraduate physics classes that I hadn't had yet as a biologist. And I ended up, um, I ended up finishing with a master's degree from CU Boulder, but it was actually an enrichment in my physics and math background. And then I ultimately finished my PhD in planetary science at the University of Arizona, uh, where I, um, where I studied planetary science and Mars, but I also did astronomy education research. And so I think in doing that, in that transition from high school teaching to eventually becoming a professor, I realized that I liked doing astronomy, but I still liked teaching astronomy. And so I mostly did astronomy education research in grad school at Cal Poly, where I was for, for 10 years, and then here at CU Boulder, uh, where I've been for two and a half years now. Um, when I was finishing my graduate, when I was in my graduate program at Arizona, I, you know, I'd worked at Fisk when I was here as a, as a graduate student. And I had realized that I would always like to have been a professional employee at Fisk. But at the time that I was in grad school, uh, I was not able to be here yet. And so when I saw that the, the Doug Duncan was retiring after being here 15, 15 years, I was really excited about the opportunity of being able to, to, return, to return to the planetarium. That's a probably a much longer winded answer than you wanted, but that's my backstory. No, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so really quick, while you were here at CU for your grad school, what did you do at the planetarium? What was your role there? Yeah, so I was a navigator. Um, I navigated, uh, which is which our navigators at Fisk are the people who control what you're seeing in the visuals on the dome. This was back in 1999, 1998, when we didn't have the digital theater we have now. We had the Zeiss projector called Fritz. Pretty sure it's my, you guys can fact check me. Uh, Zeiss Mark 4, 5, or 6. Uh, and, um, and so we navigated with that planetarium projector system. Uh, I also presented, so I you know, taught classes. I taught in the sound lab, which we still have today. Um, and then lastly, I wrote the script for Kids in Space, which is a, a, a fourth through eighth grade show that we showed from 1999 until about 2013. Um, we're actually bringing Kids from Space back. Kids from Space 2 is coming back uh, this coming fall. Um, so a script writer, navigator, and presenter. And is there, along that, you know, that path that you described, which is actually, I think, kind of uh, inspiring because it shows that you don't have to know what you want to do from square one in order to end up doing you know, something that you really enjoy. Um, so that's pretty cool. But along the way, are there any things that you learned that you wish someone would have told you or that you could have experienced earlier so that you knew to expect that coming later? I think the main thing I would tell people is to give yourself a lot of self-compassion. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with knowing exactly what you do want to do. Like that was my dad's experience. He knew from age six that he wanted to be an engineer. He became a mechanical engineer. He did mechanical engineer things until he retired at 65 and that was his path and that was awesome. Um, that was not me. And I wish that I had been just a little bit more um, acknowledging of the fact that it's okay to not know exactly what you want to do uh, at age six or age 18 or age 25 or age 32. Um, and to just realize that different people have different experiences and that's okay. Uh, I was, what I am grateful for is that I ultimately was always following what I like. I always, I always was trying to follow things that I knew that I would like. And so like, I spent a lot of time questioning at age 20 and 30 what I wanted to do, but I think through that process, I found something that I was really happy with. Um, Granted, if I had figured it out earlier, that would have been awesome, but I didn't. And so I guess I would give advice to people. If you're struggling and not quite feeling like you're doing what you want to do, always ask that question. It's like, well, what else might you want to try? And so I was grateful for the advice that I got from, I also got lots of advice from lots of friends who I nagged a lot. <laughs> Many of them are actually now still professional colleagues. Like I'm on five grant, I'm on, I'm on five grants with people who over the course of the last four years gave me advice about what to do. Um, and so those connections that I built have been strong and lasting. 
And so I was the type of person that needed a sounding board. I couldn't just dwell on it on my own. Again, that's me. Like there are plenty of people who don't need that and that's fine. So it's just good sure. to be accepting of your own personality and realize that we're all just humans trying to sort this all out. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that. Um, you do a lot of research in STEM education, kind of like meta education research. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Certainly. Um, so I guess two things that I'll share. One is I have a graduate student uh, right now who is finishing out his dissertation. He's graduating in December. Um, and we've been looking at how, how the, how, how higher education institutions like CU Boulder are using planetarium facilities. Turns out there's, there's over, over 300, almost, almost, half, almost 500 or more planetariums on university campuses. And we've been doing surveys of how those facilities are using their planetariums. Are they the same as FISC or different from FISC? More K-12, more college. Uh, when those college students are in the planetariums, how are professors engaging their students in learning? How are they using the theater as more than just a big theater for giving lectures? Or is that what they're doing? And so we're looking at how higher education faculty professors are using planetarium facilities in higher education learning. That's one project. Um, the other project that I'm doing is actually a, a, a carryover from the work that I did at San Luis Obispo, California when I was teaching at Cal Poly. Um, for about eight years there, I helped run a program called the STEM Teacher and Researcher Program, which is the acronym is STAR. And that program was specifically designed to provide summer research experience for future and aspiring science teachers, science, science and math teachers. So as I mentioned before, I was really grateful for having the opportunity to work at NASA Ames when I was teaching high school for those first four or five years that I taught. And the STAR program is the same idea, but for undergraduates and graduate students who are just going into teaching to help uh, future teachers realize that if you're gonna teach science and math, you should have science and math experiences as part of your preparation. So we ran this program for, you know, since 2007. Uh, when I left Cal Poly, we'd actually provide, provided over 600 research experiences to over almost 500 individuals. And um, we got funding from the National Science Foundation to look at whether that has made a difference in how those teachers are teaching and whether they're staying in teaching. And so I've been doing a two-year study, which is looking back at STAR Fellows from 2010 to 2016 to see what are, the, and looking at, talking to the students of those teachers, talking to the supervisors of those teachers, talking to the teachers themselves, looking at test scores, looking at employment records, and basically doing a big mega study, a long, long, longitudinal study about whether providing summer research as part of teacher preparation makes a difference about how those teachers eventually teach in their classrooms. And have you gotten any results from either of those two research projects yet, or are they still very much in the works? Nope, they're all, they're in the works, but there are plenty of results are happening. Um, I, I think the, I can't tell you all the details because we're working on publications for the second project right now. Sure. But, you know, takeaway message, we actually see them, interestingly, we see the most, we see the strongest uh, signal, the strongest measurement, the strongest, you know, measurable result when we talk to the students of the teachers, uh, both of the, the students of teachers who did research and the students of teachers who hadn't had research in their background. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, when, when teachers are self-reporting, there's a lot of like potential noise about what they're saying and what they're not saying, but it turns out students give the strongest signal. And so we've identified, we've identified five constructs that it looks like re teacher researchers are in part that the students recognize that in the classes that they that they're taking. Um, in the planetarium world, it turns out most interesting result is that we're seeing that we anticipated this, but but planetariums aren't just for astronomy anymore. Now that we've had a digital revolution, planetariums can be for art, they can be for biology, they can be for math, they can be for lots of subjects. Sure. And and the the survey results that we're sharing see that transition. And we use the Fisk Planetarium for a lot of, you know, you know, artistic styles, you know, of presentation too that are not strictly for astronomy. So it's cool to see everyone kind of around the world making use of these really awesome facilities. In these well, I wouldn't say around the world, but we have some, we have some evidence that, that this is, that this is happening. Yeah. I want to ask if becoming the director of the Fisk Planetarium has brought with it kind of any unexpected experiences for you, you know, things that you initially were like, yes, let's be the, the director of the Fisk Planetarium, 
And then in retrospect, you're like, man, that was not what I was expecting, you know, or expecting to be a part of this position. Uh, I think there's always, when you take a new position, there's always things you expected and things that were just out of the blue. Um, I've been, I've just been thrilled with how amazing the staff is at Fisk. Um, I already, already sensed that this would happen, so I guess I wasn't surprised, but I was, it's even more than I expected. Like the student staff, the 30 ish students that we, undergraduate students we have working at Fisk, the, the nine, the eight other professionals, in addition to me, who are helping uh, work there full time. It's just a really strong, supportive, cohesive group of individuals who are really top notch. And so it's been really just a, a very pleasant surprise to have such a great group of people to work with. Um, I've also been really pleased about just how much diversity there is in the planetarium space, right? So, you know, I was so excited about presenting our world premiere of a live interactive musical performance about the Voyager mission that was scheduled for March 13th, the day we closed due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so this was this beautiful synergy of, of musicians and singers who had written an entire script about the Voyager mission, one of the you know, most significant missions of NASA's history that went to the four outer gas giant planets are now the farthest things that humans have made that are out beyond our solar system. They're carrying the golden records, which tells the story of humanity. And it's just this wonderful synergy of science, art, music, amazing visuals. And so just this opportunity to do really synergistic things is really useful. And similarly, like I never thought I would be able to have as many kind of science-y, science geeky concerts as I've seen at Fisk. Uh, we've done Cosmic Kirtan, which is, you know, uh, Indian chanting around the universe. And we also had, you know, just wonderful musical groups and other individuals using the theater as a performance space. Um, is there anything, I'm gonna kind of change directions here. Is there anything that you're particularly stoked about coming up in the future of the Fisk Planetarium as we kind of look to the horizon of the, uh, the coronavirus situation, but also just in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think both in the short term and the long term. In the short term, um, I just want to really encourage people to stay connected. Um, we've been doing our best to provide virtual Fisk and dome to home and really to stay connected to the, the Boulder Front Range Denver metro area community. Um, we realize this has been a super challenging time for everyone and um, parents and kids alike and non-parents. Every, every human being on the planet is affected by the COVID crisis right now. And so uh, I'd really encourage people to stay tuned in to, we're gonna run dome to home through the entire summer. We're actually looking to do some virtual live stream concerts with DJs that you may have heard of um, that we would broadcast onto the web. And so for the duration that we aren't able to have people in our theater, we're really trying to make as much of a virtual experience possible as we can. Um, when we do reopen, and I don't know when that's gonna be, but we will reopen at some point, but when we do reopen, we're reopening with actually a, a significant number of upgrades to our theater. Uh, we went digital in 2013, and that was the biggest surprise. I'd forgotten the computers don't last more than seven or eight years. And so we actually are now replacing our 26 computer system with an eight computer system uh, seven years later, eight years later, seven years later, uh, that will be faster, have new software, have new capabilities for doing live feeds on the dome. And so we'll have just way more, even more visual capabilities than Fisk already had. And then we're also still working out the final details, but fingers, all fingers and toes crossed, uh, we're gonna be installing a flooring area on the pit that is currently in the center of our theater. We have a big, uh, a big circular pit that our former projector used to be in that is kind of unusable space that we'll be covering up with a floor area that will allow us to have kids laying down in bean bags underneath the stars, we'll be able to have way more access of people doing kinesthetic activities uh, as they're learning underneath the dome. We'll be able to do larger venue concert events where you don't have to stay in your seat the whole time. If you do wanna get up and move around, you can do that. Um, and I think it's just gonna give the space an even bigger, more expansive feel than it already has. So I guess look forward to the physical upgrades that we anticipate and then also stay connected to us virtually um, until we've been able to, to, to reopen. We're very excited to be able to reopen. It's just a matter of when, because we want to make sure that we do it safely. Uh, safety is always going to be our biggest concern. Um, just we, we need to make sure that people who come into this theater know that they will be, um, that they will have, one, have an awesome experience, but two, they'll 
remember that off of, remember that off of awesome experience uh you know for the rest of their lives all right so for more information about john's teacher research project you can check out their website star-web.csm.calpoly.edu don't worry we're gonna link that for you in the episode description so don't worry about memorizing uh, but thanks again for joining us be sure to tune in next week for our new episode it's all about black holes uh, we'll be talking with jimmy negus a phd candidate who studies active galactic nuclei so he'll tell us what exactly that means and also dr andrew hamilton who is a leading expert in the study of what's inside of a black hole so you'll definitely want to check it out we also want to invite everyone to visit our website, www.colorado.edu forward slash FISC, where you can see a schedule of our upcoming show topics and guests. There's also an option there for you to submit questions for our experts to answer on their episode. So if you have any burning questions that you'd like to hear answered on the air, leave us a message. You can use the website form or you can email us at fiskpodcast at colorado.edu. This podcast is available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And hopefully, we'll see you next week. Bye.